sharing of your faith and show the world that Jesus Christ is real to you every moment every day we show the love of God each day we live reveal Christ's presence in our lives and how the Holy Spirit guides us day by day. For God so loved the world, His only Son He gave. Share His love by telling what the Lord has done for you. Share His love by sharing of your faith. And show the world that Jesus Christ is real to you every moment, every day. Dear Lord, thank for the day, Lord, and let's come here again tonight to worship and learn more about you, God, and I offer and use it in your will, Lord. Amen. Thank you, ladies. If we continue in worship, we'll sing 162, 133, and 577. You can remain seated. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a Rescue the souls of men. Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost us. Oh, we've hopelessly lost away. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Almighty, infinite Father, faithfully loving your own, 
here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne oh we're falling before your throne you are the one that we praise you are the one that we adore you give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for oh our hearts always hunger for my jesus Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength let every breath all that i am never cease to worship you shout to the lord all the earth let us sing power and majesty praise to the king Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you how can i say thanks for the things you have done for me things so undeserved yet you give to prove your love for me the voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee, to Should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary with his blood he has saved me with his power he has raised me to kids here tonight 
and there's more youth here tonight than I've ever seen, so I need the kids and the youth to come on down. I see you hiding, Dylan. Come on. Y'all bring a hymn book. Grab a hymn book, okay? Check one, two, three. That heaven, my brother, heaven, my word. I didn't know Brother Eric had his eyes so big when he's looking at it. Sing. 
I'd sing if I was y'all. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm about like a mule eating corn and choking on corn tonight. I have a lot of drainage, and it's that time of year with all that stuff that's growing, and, and it's pretty hard to try to get you, you know, air and all of that. So, uh, But tonight we're coming in on some second part, part two number part two on Team God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at verse number 26 through 31 in chapter 1, and uh, it's Team God. We talked about this the other night. This is the second part. Don't let it fool you. Just because there's one point that I'm going to talk about tonight, um, I'm not going to belabor the point a whole long time, but there is quite a few things that I need to say. And um, Team God, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through verse number 31. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. Excuse me. And all the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boast, boast in the Lord. I want to carry you down a, a re review for just a few minutes, and so that you'll remember what we talked about in 1 Corinthians uh, and it's right there if you have your listening guide and you can just follow right along with me because I'm going to look straight at that uh, we, we looked at two things and tonight we're going to look at a third one but there was three observations from this passage that we talk about team God and uh, if you remember I talked about how that I remember when I was in Park League playing with the Green Spiders in the fifth grade year over in Northside Park in Philadelphia and they was picking teams they had about just several hundred kids strode up across the line there and they were picking teams and it come down to two guys left and I was the one that was last I remember and you, have you ever been in a situation where they were picking teams to play basketball or whatever it may be out on the playground or somewhere else in life and you were one of the last ones chosen you like, they got? it's sort of like the draft you know kind of thing when are they gonna be able to pick me when are they gonna be able to pick me and and when they don't pick you it's it's just overwhelming I mean like you feel terrible and and so but when God selects a team exactly Who's on this team? Who, who does the picking? Well, um, what we learn as we consider Team God, observation number one, we said that there's not many extraordinary people on God's team, on verse number 26 right there. And also we talked about the second thing was there's, not, uh, there's a lot of ordinary people. When you look at the disciples, they were just down-to-earth people. Uh, there, were some, there were fishermen, tax, uh, the, uh, there was a fisherman, there was a doctor. As we look at, they were just common folks. And that's who God uses on his team. Because it, we don't want to be able to say, look what I've done. I'm awesome. I'm mighty. And we'll get prideful. We'll get puffed up. And so, you know, I don't think the Lord's going to use somebody as much like that when we get boastful and when we get prideful. But there's only one star on God's team. One star on God's team, and, the Lord, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, said that he is also head of the body of the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. And so he, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the head of the team, that no man should boast before God because it's all of the Lord's doing. It's not anything that we've done. If we are anything in this world, it is because of what God's blessings upon us. It's not because we're self-made. He chooses the team. The Lord Jesus Christ you, you, uh, chooses the team. He's the captain of the team. Captain's usually revered, respected. He is the savior of the team. He's the redeemer of the team, and he is everything to the team. So he's the one who chooses who's on the team. Now, in verse number 27 and verse number 28, it says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God, in verse 28, God has chosen the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are. And so we get lost in some of that wordiness as we look at some of that. But God chooses, and like I said, if you're proud in heart in your life, God's not going to choose you because you're an abomination to him according to God's word. But God chooses those on his team. It's the weak, the, the foolish, and the despised, and those people, they see their need. 
And so with that being said, so how do you reconcile the fact that God has given us a free will and yet the scripture says, uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, and at the same time, the scripture says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. And so I think it's reconciled in that parable that Jesus told back in Matthew chapter 22 about the king, and there was a wedding feast, and it was for his son. And you remember that, and he invited different folks to come. But you know what? They didn't have time. They didn't have time to come to the wedding feast. I'm just too busy. We hear that today. I'm just too busy to, uh, to do anything anymore. And yet they, they got, gave all of these different kind of excuses. Well, I got bigger fish to fry, king. You know, I, I don't want to come to your son's wedding. Just consider me excuse. Thank you, but no thank you. And Scripture says in verse number 20, in Matthew chapter 22, that he gave the invitation and they were unwilling to come. And so the king said to his servants, well, you just go out there in the highways and into the, the byways and the hedges and you invite folks to come. Invite the blind and the lame, and he goes on to say, and those that's despised, and invite them that uh, down to the banquet hall so that it can be filled full. And so then it says in 22, 14 of Matthew, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now that word there for call there is the word that means invited is actually what it means. And so many are invited, but few are chosen. Do you know why few are chosen? Do you know who, those, uh, who the ones are that were chosen? It was the ones that were invited that said, yes, I'll come. Yes, I'm not going to make an excuse. And then you're chosen. So, But how does God choose? I mean, he chooses those who want to be chosen. He chooses those uh, that, uh, think about just lining up here for just a minute. Here comes the Lord, and, and he's choosing his team. And, and he's wondering, who should I take to be on my team? And then there he sees Tim Parker, or there he sees you. And, he, and that person has their hand up. Take me. I want to be on your team. And I see that hand. I choose you. And he goes by this person and that person, and they're totally disinterested in God and the things of God. And I, I don't want to be on your team. I don't care about your team. I, I, I'm too busy doing my own thing. I'm trying to build my own life. I'm trying to build my own th team. And I have the own cares of the world. And so he passes that one, and he passes another one, and another one. And then there's a person that holds their hands up and says, I want to be on your team. And yet, choose me, choose me. Okay, I choose you. Many are called, many are invited, but few are chosen. The ones that are chosen are the ones that say, pick me. And that's how the Lord can say, you didn't choose me, but I have chosen you. You can't come to the wedding unless I invite you. But you can't say no. Because the people in Matthew chapter 22 said no. You know, so the Lord chose his team. The, and he's the star of his team. He's the captain of his team. He does everything with the team. He chooses the team. And then he works through the team. In verse number 29, if you'll notice in your Bibles there, God works through people. God uses people. Not that anyone should boast before the Lord. Look what I've done. It's those people that you'd say, he ain't going to mount to a hill of beans. You know, that's why God takes the guys and, 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 and the, the nitwits and the misfits and the folks that are like, well, you know, they'll never be used to do anything in this world. He's not going to pick that one and says, look how good I am. God's going to do it all. And then he says in verse 30, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God. Now, let me try to break that down for you and to help you to understand what it says. He takes the, the, the nitwits and all of a sudden, they have wisdom from God. I mean, Man, where did they get this from? Well, have you ever thought about this? You could take a, a guy. Now, some of you, that, if you know anything about intellectualism, I just want to know, how many of you have ever heard of Stephen Hawking? Anybody? Okay, several of you have. Stephen Hawking has been basically classified as a genius. I believe he's a physicist. I think that's how you say that word. And he is an absolute genius. Now, if you ever notice some of those kind of people, seemingly they don't have time for God. The smarter they are, they're very humanistic in their thinking. Oh, man, I, I, if you can't explain it, then it's not real. And so Stephen Hawking, he, he has really a, a strong brain, but yet he has rejected God. How many of you ever heard of Richard Dawkins? Anybody heard of Richard Dawkins? Richard Dawkins. Uh, he has rejected God. I mean, how smart is a guy? And when I say a guy, I'm talking about a person, man, woman, person. How smart is a person that rejects God? How smart is someone who is an atheist? The Lord gives them one half and of one verse in Psalm 14, 1. The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. You know what that says? You 
that reject God are free. God says that. And you're not some super smart guy. You may have a high IQ, but you are a dummy because you have rejected God. And the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. And I'd like to take a guy with an IQ of 90 that trusts in the Lord and believes in the Lord and loves the Lord than a person who has an IQ of 150 and rejects God. Who's the fool? It's the person that rejects God. I can't imagine. Adrian Rogers used to say this. He said, I'd rather be in heaven saying my ABCs than in hell spouting off philosophy any day of the week. I think that's pretty good. And that's so true. The Lord says, hey, I'm, I'm going to give you wisdom from God. And, and God means that he's going to wipe away our sins and he'll justify you. And sanctification, he's, that's going to come into our life. Now, what does that big old word mean? It simply means that he sets you apart. He begins to work in your life. When you ask Christ and to come into your heart and you ask Jesus to come into your life and, and he makes you more like Christ and then redemption, and which is the process of glorification he makes you more like Christ in your body and so see righteousness has to do with your spirit and where the Lord comes in and he washes you white as snow and that happens boom just like that sanctification it's a process it'll take place in your life you see it's not like well I accepted Jesus and that's all it is to it I'm gonna sit down over here for the next 90 years and I'm not gonna do anything you see, when you get saved, you are beginning to be sanctified, set apart. There's a reason that you're going to be used by God. And it's kind of like the situation with Lazarus. When, he, when Jesus told those people after he raised him from the dead, he said, now unbind him and let him go. That's the process of sanctification. It's where the wrappings of this world it begins to, has wrapped us up. And so that process of sanctification, we find that your old life, it is taken off of you and you become a, a person who is more free and more free and you live your life more like Jesus. And then there's redemption. When the Lord actually gives you a brand new body and you're like Christ in your body. Salvation is not just internal. When you ask Christ into your heart down here, it's not just internal. It's, just, it's not just in your spirit. It's spirit and soul and body. You are a house of three rooms. And God redeems and he changes all three rooms. That is your spirit. That is your body. That is um, your soul. He changes. And all of those things happen. And God takes these people who are weak, the people that are foolish, the people that are despised, the people that are made fun of, and he says, this is the person that I'm going to use. This is the person that I can use because they will honor me and they will give glory to God. He will take and he will take the person that is, or that, that is ignoble and the base things and he, and he makes them trophies of his grace and all by his doing. Because if he takes somebody who thinks that they're really the all-star and he's a, a peacock that's strutting around, then that person will boast before the Lord. Let me just tell you, look what, you know, look what I've got. You know, you've got something that's pretty sharp here, God. You know, uh, uh, God, I, I'm, I, I've humbled myself to be on your team. Nobody's going nobody's gonna to do that. No peacocks in heaven. Everybody in heaven is blown away that they're there. They're just so grateful. Wow. P Paul was so grateful. He's the chief of sinners. He's ahead of them. Wow, the Lord would choose me. You know, and you read his testimony in 1 Timothy chapter 1. You go back and read his testimony. He said, I was a persecutor. I was a blasphemer. I was a violent aggressor, and the Lord chose me. He said, I am the chief of sinners. I'm the first in line when it comes to blowing and doing bad. But yet he chose me. That's what Paul said. And Paul was wise according to the flesh. He was a very smart guy. And so the Lord chose him, and it was all of his doing, the Lord's doing. And so the Lord does it through us. And I'm simply saying I love the story of Gideon. Gideon in chapter number 6 of the book of Judges. And he's threshing wheat in the wine press. You don't want to miss what I'm about to say. You need to listen closely. Gideon was there in Judges chapter 6, and he was threshing wheat, and it was in the wine press, and it was down low. And you had a wine press that usually was, was in low depth. And so you don't thresh wheat down low. What you do is when you thresh wheat, you thresh wheat up on the hill so that when you throw the wheat in the air, the wind catches it, and it blows all that bad stuff, the chaff away, and, and all you have is that good grain left. And so he was afraid of the Midianites. And so he's down there inside of this hole there. And the Lord comes to him. And, and Israel at this time was oppressed by Midian. 
And the reason that he was threshing wheat in this hole was because the Midianites were going to come and they were going to steal away all the grain. And when they saw him, they were probably going to have to kill him. And he's trying to hide, just, just trying to just make it by. And the Lord comes to him and he says, Hail, mighty man of valor, is what God says to him. And Gideon's like, Who are you talking to? I know you ain't talking about me. And Gideon, is, uh, and that's what God said. And he said, you, uh, he said, you must have taken a wrong turn, Lord, down there at Jezreel. I mean, why are you calling me mighty men of valor? You know, I, I'm down here in a hole. I'm scared to death. I, I, I'm just thinking the Midianites are going to be here any, any minute. This has got to be a dream. And so, basically, he was Chicken Little. You know who Chicken Little is? Who is Chicken Little? Cole, who is Chicken Little? The sky is falling. He was scared, wasn't he? And here he is. He's the chicken little. And he's being called a mighty man of valor. Hail, mighty man of valor. The Lord is with you, as he said. And the Lord said to Gideon, chicken little, by the way, he says, you're going to deliver Israel. You're the one that I've chosen. And look at the response in Judges chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. I know you didn't go there, but that's, that's where I'm going to roll over there and look at this. It says, oh, Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? He is questioning God. Have you ever done that before? <laughs> team God. Does God want me to be on his team? God, I can't, really, I, I can't do this. I can't do this. He said, oh, Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? He said, behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. He's bargaining with God. But the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Medians as one man. Now, Gideon in no way was trying to defeat Median, this bunch of folks by himself, because he's zero, he's nothing, he's a nobody. And he's foolish, and he's weak, and his family's weak. And basically, hey, have y'all heard about that family down there? If you have that last name, you know they're a bunch of weaklings. And they, they, you know, their elevator don't go to the top very good. Basically, he was saying something about like this. That's basically what he was saying. He was the runt of the litter. You know what the runt of the litter is? Cole, what is the run of the litter? It, it's a puppy that, like, something done happened to him. He was the last one. He's the smallest. Nobody wants to buy it. We used to sell dots and puppies, weenie dogs. And, and it's amazing. There are some people that come along and wanted to buy the run of the, and there's some of the people just attracted to that one. It was just the odd one. The little one had something different. And this man was the run of the bunch, Gideon. And God says, yeah, but I can use you. I can feel you. And, and so Judges chapter 6 and verse 34 says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon this man, came upon Gideon. Literally, that's what it says in, in the Hebrew. And, and so the, the Spirit of the Lord clothed him with Gideon. I like that. The Lord clothed him. And so God so just filled Gideon, and he, and he wore Gideon like a suit. And he defeated Median and the Midianites with this chicken little guy because God did it through him. It wasn't him. It was God. And Median had all of these armies, 132,000 people, if I remember correctly. And God whittled down Gideon's army to 300 dog lappers. And with 300 dog lappers, they, they whipped all of those guys, and so the glory went to the Lord. And, and when Gideon had 32,000, you know what the Lord said to him? He said, you got too many. You have too many. And so he said, uh, we're going to have to thin it down a little bit. And so after he said, to the people, Gideon said, is there anybody that's afraid? If you are scared, you can leave now. 10,000 of them walked away. And so after the stampede, after the stampede, let me correct myself, they had 10,000 that was left. And so they, they've got like 130,000 people still over there. And he says, Lord, we got this many. We can do it. We can do it. And God thinned it down to 300 so that God would get all of the glory. God had David, a 15-year-old kid with a slingshot and a stick, and he went up against a giant. Why? So that God could get all the glory, that, so that no flesh could boast before the Lord. Now, what are the implications of that? And what are the blessing points of that? As we close tonight, uh, you know, because the blessing points are so cool here. Number one, there's no pressure on God's team. There's no pressure. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to say, man, i got to score the points. when the, It's getting down there. It's fixing to be the last seconds on the clock. i got to make the bucket. I have got to be able to score the touchdown. The time is fixing to expire on the clock. I've got to do this. No, it's all on the Lord. It's not on you. It's not on me. It's on the Lord. 
You can't score any points. I can't score any points. I can't hit that home run. He scores all the points. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And Jesus said, you can do nothing without me. And Gideon scored big time because the Lord wore him like a suit. God was all over him. And that takes the pressure off. You know, I, I don't have to be Billy Graham. I just have to be me. John Wooden, the great basketball coach, I think it was of UCLA years ago, he said, don't ever compare yourself with some, someone else. He said, because that's not right. He said, you don't compare yourself with someone else. You compare yourself with a person that you can be that God wants you to be. And that's what he said. I think that's pretty good. Because you have control over being the person that God wants you to be. You don't have any control about being better than somebody else. You just have to control, have that control over you being the best that you can possibly be. And so, that takes the pressure off. Man, all I got to do is to be yielded to the Lord. Lord, I want you to wear me like a suit. I want God's blessings. If God is not going to fill me, if God is not going to be all over me, I don't want no part of it. I don't want to try to do it in my own flesh. Do what? I'm talking about do anything for the Lord. Teach a Sunday school class. To, to go out on a visitation of which we so desperately need it here. And so we need to say, Lord, I want you on my, all over my life. Wear me like a suit like you did Gideon. There's no boasting because it's all about Jesus. He gets the glory. And when you consider God's team, where do you stand? Are you on the team? Are you on God's team? If you are, yes, Brother Tim, I know without a doubt in my mind that I'm on God's team. Well, then let me ask you this. You're on the team. Are you yielded to the Lord? Are you in good relation with the coach? Are you living life simply saying, it's all about Jesus. It's not about me. Are you living life without the pressure of you having to do it? You see, we think that we have to do it. But we can't. But God can. You can't score any points. He scores all the points. By his doing, you were in Christ Jesus. You just let Jesus be Jesus in you. That's what you need to be. And so God's team, he has a team, and he's the all-star. He's the head of it. And if you're on God's team, oh, my goodness, it makes me think of basketball when I was in high school. I didn't play, but I watched a lot of my friends. And some of them were starters. And some of them, they stay on the bench a lot. And I think about sometimes how that we may, those chairs that those guys sit in, and then they would have a timeout, timeout, and everybody comes over here to huddle, and they huddle up. Those guys get off the bench, go listen, and they go to sit back down. Or if it gets exciting, let me get up and clap. And I think sometimes we become more of a spectator as a Christian, sitting in those, on the sidelines. And God has called you to be a star. God has called you to get out there on the floor. He's called you to get out there on that kickoff. God has called you to be you with him living and working through your life. So you don't have to produce. That's one of the things that bothers me as a pastor, that I feel like so much pressure, and then I realize, Tim, he's called you. You leave the results up to him. You be faithful to what he's called you to do. And you honor God in everything and let him score the points. He'll add to the church as he sees fit. And that's what we have to do. Tonight you may say, Brother Tim, I'm, I'm sitting over there in one of those chairs. I'm on the sideline at the gym. I'm sitting in one of those chairs. It's been a long time since I've been out there in that game. I sort of felt like Coach wanted me to go in, but I told Coach, Coach, I can't do that. No, not me. You, some, hey, let him do it. And I'm going to sit right over here. A lot of us have been sitting through tournaments. We have been sitting for a long time and saying, let somebody else do it. There's no way I can do it. You know what? I believe we're just like Gideon and we're playing chicken with him. We need to say, yes, Lord. Here am I. I can't do it but you can through working through my life. And my grandma always told me, I remember she told me many times, Tim, you can't do this, but God can do whatever he wants working through your life. 
And I fully didn't understand what she meant by that until a long time later. Don't work in your own power. You work in the strength and the power of God. I had a, I had a Presbyterian doctor, Dr. Sam Suttle, Louisville, Mississippi. And I was very sick. Had a lot of different kind of issues with like just being nerves and, and having some church members that was more or less like T-Rex. Sink their teeth in you and cut you up. And he looked at me one day. I went in to see him. And he said, I'm telling you before I even start talking to you about anything. He said, your problem. And he said, you're a pastor. He said, but I'm going to tell you. He said, I'm a Presbyterian. He said, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to do God's. And I believe God spoke to that man through that man. He said, you're trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength. He said, you can't do it, and you're going to fail trying. He said, you have to allow God to use you, and God come upon you, and, and the power of God to work through your life. Let him be the one. And that's what he was talking about. Just like Gideon, God will raise a person up for the hour and for the occasion, and he will use them. It's not the person that feels like they have arrived, and I am God's gift. No. It's the one that you least suspect. The one that you I want us to have a time of prayer right now. And I want to pray for you. I want to pray sincerely. Maybe God has dealt with your heart in this invitation tonight. I want you to do what God wants you to do. I want you to get your heart right with the Lord. You may say, Brother Tim, I'm being chicken little tonight. Well, you know what? We serve a God of second chances. And I believe that God is going to give you a second chance at this thing. If you're on team God, you need to be active. You need to be serving. And you need to be excited. And you need to really get to know the coach real good. Because he's a, he knows a little more than those players that sit on the side. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you take a, a person with warts, moles, and all in their life. Father, a person that it's like a lump of clay that's been out of shape. A life that there's no way it seemed like God could use. You took a man and he was imprisoned and he reached people, even the person that he was chained to. He reached people for the cause of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that you still work through people's lives like that. And God, we, I just pray you would send forth laborers in the field. Father, I pray, God, that Lord, if there's somebody in this place tonight, God, I believe there is. Somebody tonight, they are on team, God. But they have gotten bluffed by the devil. They have gotten scared. And they've taken themselves out of the game. And they have been content to sit over there in that chair on the sideline while other people are playing. Other people are doing their very best to do what coaches told them to do. I pray tonight, Lord, we would get up out of that chair and that we would go to coach and that we would tell him coach if you need me you can count on me Lord help us to go to you with all of our heart being open and honest because I know that there's people that need the Lord and that may be the only person that would ever reach them would be one of these that are sitting on the pews of the Middle Baptist Church Father there's some indifference in people's hearts because Lord they used to come to this church Father they used to be a part of it they don't go anywhere Lord, they've gotten so involved in some other things and they have let other things come in the way of the Lord. I pray for that heart of that person. I pray that in the name of Jesus, that conviction would come upon them and that they would see the error of their way and that they would be able to get their life right with the Lord. Help us to be an open Bible and realize that people are reading it every day. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask if you would to stand to your feet. And I'm going to ask if you would to sincerely look inside of your heart and ask yourself, am I on team God? And number two, am I in the game?